Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Whether it's Steve McQueen outrunning a Dodge Charger in Bullet, or Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane in hot pursuit of those good old Duke boys, a chase can provide thrilling entertainment to a rapt audience. And not just on TV or in the movies. Go to any rodeo and you're liable to see folks chasing steer, leaping from horses to tackle and pin them to the ground. The people of Gloucester, England also love a good chase. They hold one every year, though not for cars or livestock. The event got its start over 150 years ago, though the actual dates are unknown. Originally held by the local village of Brockworth, the chase takes place each spring at nearby Cooper's Hill. One theory states it began as a method of preserving grazing rights for local farmers. Another claims it stemmed from a pagan ritual where objects, such as burning brushwood, were rolled down the hill to ring in the new year. It's also believed that the ceremony acted as a way to encourage a bountiful harvest. Regardless of how it all started, though, it wasn't written about formally until the 1800s. Once word got out, Brockworth villagers got more than they bargained for. People from New Zealand, Australia, and the United States started coming in to join in the festivities, either as competitors or merely as spectators. And with more contestants came more opportunities for injury. In 1993, 15 people were treated for everything from mild bruises to broken bones, all sustained as a result of the chase. In 2009, the event was canceled entirely because it was deemed a public health crisis. But a few local organizers got together the following year and held a much smaller version. Every time government officials attempt to put a stop to the Cooper's Hill chase, journalists and citizens who refuse to abandon tradition put on a chase of their own. Which leaves one final question. What exactly was everyone chasing? The answer is cheese. That's right, as many as 500 people from all over the globe still gather to this day at the top of Cooper's Hill to chase an 8-pound wheel of cheese for 200 yards. Double Gloucester cheese, to be exact, which is protected on its side by a wooden casing and decorated before it's set loose. Now, you might not think chasing cheese down a hill could be so dangerous, but with so many people colliding into one another or tripping on rocks and divots in the ground, the injuries start to pile up. Even the cheese itself can be a hazard. No one has ever died during a chase, but one year the cheese reached a whopping 70 miles per hour and hit a spectator, sending them to the hospital. That's why at the bottom of the hill are an army of paramedics waiting to treat anyone involved in a cheese-related incident. Local rugby players even volunteer to catch participants who may lose their footing, or carry people down the hill who are unable to do so on their own. Gloucester's tradition has inspired other English towns to try something similar. The city of Chester has been holding their own cheese rolling competition since 2002 as part of their food and drink festival. Their total injury list remains at zero. But not Cooper's Hill. The broken ankles and concussions sustained during the Gloucester event have made it a kind of rite of passage for thrill seekers and athletic types. It's estimated that there are roughly 33 injuries reported for every 100 contestants. One year, so many participants got hurt that there weren't enough ambulances to cart them all off to the hospital afterwards. Still, every year, folks come back to try their luck again. For fame, for glory, and for the grand prize. But it's not a massive pot of money they're after. Whoever catches the cheese before it reaches the bottom gets to take the cheese home. It seems that when it comes to that eight-pound wheel of double Gloucester cheddar, no one is a fan of Catch and Release. When a crime goes beyond the capabilities of the average beat cop, a detective is often called in. They'll interview witnesses, analyze a crime scene, and pour over the clues until they found the culprit. Francois Vidoc was a French criminal during the early 19th century, but eventually turned his expertise in crime into a legitimate business as the first ever private detective. Izzy Einstein and Mo Smith were federal officers during Prohibition. 
Together, they arrested over 4,300 people and had a 95% conviction rate. They were so successful, they were laid off after Washington officials grew jealous of their fame. They left policing behind and became successful insurance salesmen. And then there's Arthur Price Roberts. Arthur didn't have the criminal history that Vidoc had, nor was he as well known as Einstein and Smith. But he had a gift, and he used that gift to help others. Born in Wales in 1866, he moved to the United States early in life to seek out opportunity. Once settled in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Roberts began helping others with unique and unfortunate problems. Duncan McGregor, for example, hailed from the city of Peshtigo, along the eastern edge of Wisconsin. In 1905, Mr. McGregor had gone missing and his wife was distraught, so she sought the assistance of Mr. Roberts. Arthur was known around town as a psychic. He went into a trance, hoping for a sign of Mrs. McGregor's husband. After some time, he found him, but the outlook wasn't good. He informed both Mrs. McGregor and the police that Mr. McGregor had been murdered. According to Arthur, the man's body had been thrown into the Menominee River. The police traveled to the spot that he told them about and found the body of the late Mr. McGregor among some sunken logs. Robert started building a reputation for himself as a man who could find anyone, anywhere. J.D. Leroy, a wealthy Chicago businessman, had been looking for his missing brother. Roberts was brought in and got a read on Mr. Leroy's sibling, and much like Mr. McGregor, it was bad news. Roberts described an area of Devil's Canyon in New Mexico where J.D.'s brother could be found. He, too, had been murdered, and his body had been disposed of among the rocks and mountains. New Mexico authorities followed Roberts' directions and found the late Mr. Leroy 200 yards from the exact spot that he had described to them. But Arthur didn't just help find missing people. He could also predict events that might happen in the future. On October 18th of 1935, he told Milwaukee police that a series of bombings would take place around the city. Banks, police stations, and City Hall were all at risk. By that time, Roberts was a known entity and someone to pay attention to. Where other so-called psychics might go ignored, the Milwaukee police force was on alert. Just over a week later, the first explosion occurred at the village hall. Two people were killed. Two banks were blown up the following day, just as Roberts had predicted followed by two police stations. A detective by the name of English pleaded for more details. Will there be another bomb? How big? And who is doing this? Roberts told him that on Sunday, November 4th, the biggest and final explosion would take place on the Menominee River. Sure enough, a garage just beyond the river exploded that day. It turns out that the two men responsible for all the other bombings had been putting a new device together when it accidentally went off and killed both of them. Roberts had gotten some details wrong in his prediction. The names of the bombers, for example, as well as the timing of the explosion. Still, there were enough similarities to make any skeptic consider that Roberts' predictions weren't complete bunk. His talents had given numerous people closure over the years, and saved countless lives. And they even worked on himself. At a dinner party in 1939, where he was the guest of honor, he stood up and thanked everyone for coming. He told them that, sadly, he wouldn't be present for the next one. I won't be with you beyond January 2nd, 1940, he told them. And he wasn't. Because that was the exact day that Arthur Price Roberts passed away. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.